Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, this session is going to flow on from the options and talk more about the implied volatility. Of course, implied volatility is uh, derived from options prices um, and is a great measure of uh, risk. So let's jump in and have a look at this one. Um, so what we've got, when we're talking about risk, uh, there's two types of metrics that we use in technical analysis. Uh, the first is historical volatility. Um, and the second is implied volatility. So the thing about historical volatility is we know, you know, it's factual. It's, it's looking back and saying, this is the volatility based on the last 10, 20, 30 days of um, data. Uh, it basically what we do over the look back period. So let's make it 21 days for one month. Um, we look back over that period, we calculate the standard deviation. And then with that standard deviation, we annualize that number. And so historical volatility and implied volatility are annualized um, numbers. Uh, so that, that would be if the conditions remain the same over the whole year, well, this is how much we'd expect the security to move either up or down um, because that's the, the volatility. The volatility in this regard, what we're measuring is the change. You know, how much do we expect prices to move either up or down. You know, we're not making any sort of decision on, on which direction at this point. Um, it doesn't give an indication about exactly where the price is going to be. It's just giving a range of what has happened in the past when we talk about historical volatility. Um, and then calculated using the recent trading activity. Now implied volatility. This is where, you know, in the options section, we talked about um, how you can buy put options um, and how um, you can have uh, all these options on the securities. Now, when you see that rising and put options rising, you know, we, we talked about this in the put call ratio, that um, that's telling us that there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear um, and an expectation that the market's going to drop. And so people are trying to um, buy insurance for their portfolios. Now, when we look at that, you know, we can derive from the volume and the values of those options what um, the implied volatility is. And it's not actual volatility exactly as the name suggests. We're implying what we think the volatility will be based on um, what we're seeing in the options prices. Uh, and so that's being calculated there. It's a indication of risk. We often look at it. So the VIX for the S&P 500 is the, the, you know, we often call it the fear index um, because it tells us what people are thinking. Again, a, a great consensus indicator. Um, and usually it spikes after the market starts falling, but, um, you know, some interesting um, uh, things that we can get out of that. Um, as option buying increases, now just like every other um, commodity out there, if we've got more and more people buying options, well, you need to have people writing options. Now, as the demand increases, well, the price of those options are going to increase as well. Uh, and so that's, again, where um, you know, you've got those valuations of options and those sorts of things. But as those prices go up, well, the implied volatility goes up as well. So it takes into consideration the price of the options um, uh, there as well. So here's a chart which um, highlights for the S&P. Uh, got S&P on the top. In the bottom pane, uh, the blue line is our historical volatility uh, set to 21 days. So it's roughly one month. Um, and then we have our implied volatility. Now implied volatility um, with the VIX, it's the 30-day the implied volatility. Uh, and we'll talk a lot more about that um, in this session, but also the next session, um, which focuses on the VIX. They're both fairly short sessions, these ones. Um, so what we can see with this chart, which is just really worth noticing, in when we look at, let me bring the pointer across. So here we've got November 2016. And you can see the peak that's happening in the implied volatility uh, around the times of the election. Uh, and then after the election, that fears um, uh, dissipated away uh, again. Interestingly, from a historical volatility, yeah, we did have a spike up um, historically, and that would have been due to this price change here. 
Um, but again, historical volatility has dropped away as well. Um, you know, there's times where mostly these two are together. They're both set to the same scale, um, but obviously we're seeing this situation where uh, implied volatility is getting up higher than historical volatility. I'm not sure what to make of that yet. I was pondering that last night as to, uh, you know, what does that tell us? Does that tell us that people have a, um, you know, tendency to fear more uh, than what's actually out there? Um, don't know. So it'll be interesting actually to sort of monitor those two together and see how they, they work in different phases of the markets. So the next section here on the put call parity uh, talks about how when puts rise in value, that calls are going to rise with them. Um, now, the reason for that, so let's, let's talk about this situation of fear. Let's take the election where um, people are like, oh no, things could be going bad. Let me take out some insurance to protect my portfolio. Uh, of course, you can understand, you know, demand increases for puts, puts are going up in value. But why would calls go up in value as well? Now the reason for that is this put call parity. We talked about it in the option section where I can take a, uh, a put and a underlying stock and I can have a call profile. The combination of those gives me a call profile. So because of that, if I can have that and I have the calls as well, you almost get this arbitrage situation where uh, it's then suddenly cheaper to work with the, the calls and the underlying to match the, the put profile uh, than it is necessarily to take out a put. And so you get this whole um, mixing of the two um, and, and because of that, that brings the call prices up because then there's demand for calls as well because some people are using it in, the, um, in, in that way, in a combination, rather than just taking out puts uh, and things as, like that. Um, so because we can take the, create this payoff with the put, if the call did not rise in value, there would be an arbitrage opportunity. That opportunity would be exploited, which pushes the prices of the call up. Uh, and that's why they both end up rising. So it's estimating price movement. Now we're going to get into some calculations a lot uh, for CMT1, CMT2. You know, we talk about how you don't need to memorize formulas and things like that. Well, this is one that you do need to memorize. Uh, and, and really understand uh, all of these uh, calculations here. We're going to talk about them here and we talk about them again in the VIX section. Um, so do make sure you, uh, you remember these. So implied volatility measures the size of, of the expected move in a period of time. The VIX is the expected move in 30 days time. But the, you've got to, you really got to wrestle with this because it's the expected move in 30 days time, but the percentage is annualized. And so it's not the actual movement that you're expecting, um, but it's, it's annualized. So you've got to divide it by the square root of 12. So we'll do lots of examples of this over the next few slides. Uh, it's the projection of the annualized one standard deviation move in the underlying price over the life of the option. I know that's a mouthful, a bit of statistics there, and we'll do a bit more in a future lesson. Uh, the one day movement, for instance, it um, equals the VIX divided by the square root of 252. Now these numbers are gonna be strange. You may be asking, why isn't it 365? 252 is a great estimation of 252 trading days in a year. So with all of these numbers, you know, we've got over here, um, you know, if we've got annualized volatility, then how do we get that down to, well, what's the monthly move? Well, we divide it by um, the square root of 12. Uh, what's the weekly move? We divide it by the square root of 50, not 52. We'll use 50 because again, it's a better estimation um, of the, um, uh, the actual trading experience. Um, daily expected move divided by 252. You have got to remember these numbers. Uh, you know, that's very important there. So an example here, uh, if the VIX is at 11.47%, you know, because at the, at the end of the day, the VIX value is a percentage. Um, so if it's at 11.47%, uh, the daily expected move is 11.47 divided by the square root of 252, uh, which equals 0.72%. Uh, and so if currently, 
you know, the, as of writing this slide, um, late in February, the S&P was at 23.67. That means that we can multiply that by 0.72. So we've got a plus or minus expectation of 17 uh, points on the SPY, which is our expected daily move um, over the next um, day or so at these levels of volatility. Uh, so that's how these calculations are done. And as I said, we'll do more examples. Remember from statistics that one standard deviation gives us the range that we are 68.2% certain that the price will be there within one year's time. Or, you know, so within the period of time. So from a, from a Gaussian point of view, we have the normal distribution. Our first standard deviation is where we expect 68% of our results to, um, to end up. And this is what implied volatility is working with. It's saying the one standard deviation, where do we expect that to, um, to um, be? The calculation for the VIX uh, is based on the 30-day options. Um, and we'll talk more about that in the VIX. But the idea is saying, let's look at where we think the volatility is over 30 days. Um, and where the expectations are, and we reverse engineer that back into the implied volatility number. So again, let's go and do some more math examples here. Um, got a little table there, it's a little bit hard to read on the screen, but in your notes it should be clearer. Um, but it's essentially it's telling you if you're wanting to go from annual to daily, let's come down to the table here. So we've got annual to daily, um, I need to divide by square root of 252. If I need to go from annual volatility down to monthly, I divide by the square root of 12. Um, these are the numbers that you need to remember. Um, you should have a calculator in the exam. Uh, they should provide you one. Or I, I'm not actually sure on the rules on whether you can take your own in. Probably a simple one, definitely not a programmable calculator. Um, but even if they don't, uh, you can memorize these numbers. You know, the square root of 252 is 15.87. If, if you were really pushed in an exam question and you were told to calculate the daily movement based on the volatility, well, you just take that volatility number and divide it by 16 um, and, you know, scribble out that and get a good estimation of where you think that should be. I know when I did the exams on the computer screen, there was a very simple calculator. I don't know whether it could do square roots. I can't remember that. Um, so, you know, memorizing those would be um, uh, handy to have. All right, some examples. So if the implied volatility of a call option is 97% with one day left to expiry, the market is anticipating a one day move of, well, what would it be? Now, you may be sitting there saying, there's no price, how do I know? We don't need to. Everything we're doing here is just percentage based. And so what we would do Knowing that the implied volatility is annualized, we would take 97%, um, we would divide that by the square root of 252, which gives us 6.11%. So the market is expecting, because the um, implied volatility is so high on this, and that is a massively high number, um, obviously it's a hugely volatile security that we're talking about, potential for a 6% change um, within one day. So that's obviously huge right out there. Um, next one there, a VIX reading of nine implies an expected move of what in the S&P 500 over the next 30 days? So we want to know over the 30 days, um, you know, so we take 9% divided by the square root of 12 and that's an expectation of 2.6% uh, in the, um, the next 30 days. Remember that 2.6%, you know, if this is where the S&P is today, then this is saying that over the next 30 days, we could be 2.6% up or we could be 2.6% down. But that is the range that we're expecting to be in. Um, and so the final example, again, if the VIX, which is the 30 day implied volatility is 15, what is the expected move in the S&P 500 over the next month? I mean, these ones are actually a little bit nasty because we know that the VIX is the 30-day volatility and they're saying it in the question, you know, the VIX, the 30-day volatility, you know, so you can naturally assume, now any test writer worth their salt uh, would put 15 as an as a answer there. 
um, you know, one of the four options in the multiple choice because there'd be a number of people who would say, oh, over the next month, it's 30 day option, uh, 30 day volatility, I'm just gonna take 15. No, the VIX and the implied volatility is annualized. So we've got to bring it back. Uh, it's built off the 30 days, but then annualized forward. So we do 15 divided by the square root of 12, which is 4.33. All right, so the impact on the options. Implied volatility, it's an indication as to whether an option is cheap or expensive. So when you're looking at the premium, um, you know, and you're looking at the implied volatility of the, um, of the stock, you get an idea of, well, how much time value is being used here in this premium or in, in the value of the option? And is that justified based on the implied volatility um, of this um, underlying stock? And so as prices for options rise, implied volatility rises, um, or the volatility moves opposite to price is you know, the other way uh, that you, you, know, you can talk about it. Um, the determination is made by comparing implied volatility against historical values. Again, it's not so much that we would look at it and say, um, well, it's met this threshold, so that's now too expensive. It's more saying, am I at high volatility? Am I at low volatility? How's that being reflected in price uh, and comparing things historically? Option traders use implied volatility to define whether options are overvalued or undervalued. Uh, an IV will rise before a major event like an earnings report or a presidential election uh, because traders are protecting their portfolios by buying more puts, which puts up the um, uh, implied volatility value. Um, price can trend for long periods. So price could be in a nice steady uptrend while implied volatility is stationary. Uh, and that's because there's no expectations of any big shocks. And so it keeps implied volatility fairly consistent. All right, so that's understanding implied volatility. Um, CMT1, you need to be able to describe the difference between historical and implied. CMT2, you need to understand those as well in the calculations, standard deviation being used on a look back period for historical, whereas uh, implied calculated on the, um, the price of the underlying options. Um, and then it's being annualized. Um, need to understand, you know, CMT1, you need to understand the put call parity uh, and how that keeps that when puts go up, calls are gonna go up because the, um, the call and the underlying can be used in the same profile as a put. Uh, and so the demand for both uh, increase. Uh, you need to be able to calculate the single day implied volatility by dividing by square root of 252. CMT2, you need to be able to calculate the uh, 30 day um, volatility by dividing by square root of 12. Um, just make sure you know them and you'll be in great position for the exam. Um, uh, CMT2, you need to be able to identify volati volatility risk from a chart and data. And that would be like that chart we had where we're looking at the volatility um, underneath and being able to say, are we high volatility, are we low? And I'm sure there's going to be questions about what would you expect um, happening to options as volatility increases and, and things like that. Um, and so again, it's comparing volatility behavior with corresponding price behavior. All right, so that's implied, understanding implied volatility. Uh, the next session continues on. It's a real quick one, on, especially on the VIX.